preeminent sign of the African spiritual high culture because it honors first of all the mother, the womb. It honors the father and the synthesis, the children that comes from the womb through the seed of the father. It also symbolizes the water that rises up from the earth, up to the clouds, falling back on the earth as rain to bring vegetation out of the ground. It also is spirit, mind, and matter. So however you look at Ankh, it shows the continuous regeneration of the life force. Welcome back. Video number five, Mass Deception, the Sons of Disobedience. I want to start with Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 13. And this is because we're in Egypt. I want to show you the idols he was talking about or the idol he was talking about. Uh, and then tie that into what Jesus gives us a promise, a solemn guarantee about, by which I need you to understand, there ain't too many places in the Bible where I can look and Jesus gives us a guarantee about some stuff. But this here, it's by his own words and he gives us many illustrations for this to help clear up some of the, the, the paintings uh, that are distorted that the Roman Catholic Church magistrate has set out for people to believe in. And people have been seeing this and believing this, even though it's not in scripture. So I want to unveil some of that stuff and prove the scriptures by the scriptures. That is what I do. This is proving all things. I'm Dr. Paul, the lesser, and we're going to dive in now. So we have Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 13. It says, this is what the Lord God says. I will destroy the idols and put an end to the images in Memphis. There will no longer be a prince in Egypt, and I will instill fear in that land. So he said in the city of Egypt, he will break down, destroy the idols. And we saw that when the people came from out of Egypt, they were in exodus mode, which means to have a mass amount of people being withdrawn from an area. They were coming from out of, right? They were even suffering through withdrawal from the things that they practice, from the things that they belong to, from the things that they talk to, and uh, from the ideas of the stuff that they thought inhabited these statues that they were worshiping to. So they were going through these nervous breakdowns, and it says that it wasn't just one type of people that went out with Moses. It says that it was a mixed multitude by the masses, right? So there were many different cultures and nations within this group that came out together by the millions, okay? So he gave us the promise he would break this thing. We didn't see that the statue came out in the form of a standard, the serpent on the pole, which was called Nehushtan. It was called Nehushtan because it was a worthless thing by a king of God whom God loved for his attitude of destroying the statues and showing the people, yes, I allowed for you to worship this cross for a while to prove to people in the future everything is recorded for, for, for our benefit so that we might believe and receive and understand properly the things that God wants us to know within his will, which means testament. testament. It also means witness. So we have this witness that God will allow people to do some stuff and seem like they're blessed and feel like they're blessed in what they're doing. But then later on, he'll go and he'll destroy what they've been doing all this time. And then they're stuck in confusion like, well, I thought this was okay because they have been getting away with it for so long. But people fail to understand that God is a just God and he does have patience and his patience is infinite. But even though his patience is infinite because he's judge, he has to act on his judge nature. He cannot do without it, right? So with that judge nature stepping in, it has to override the patience, okay? So his patience with us cannot reign and last forever when we're continually doing wrong, all right? So if there's making a mistake, that's one thing. But then once you've been told about something, you've been warned about something, uh, you've been shown about something and proven about something, and you're still going out doing that exact same thing, without the change in heart, without the turnaround, without producing the fruits that are in line with repentance, without repentance, that same word repentance or repentant is still just serpents. 
When you rearrange those letters, take nothing from it, add nothing to it, it's still serpents. So you can't ride the fence and say, I'm for God, but I'm not going to sow seeds with God. He says, if you're not sowing seeds with me, you're sowing seeds against me. There is no fence to ride. So he showed the people, I allowed them to get away with this for a while. And they really, they really believed in their mind. It was okay. And they're getting away with it. Nothing's going to happen to them. And eventually he broke the statue, the standing on the pole, the, the Nehushtan, which means again, a worthless thing, which is trash. And when you look up the etymology for trash, you'll find out that it says lumber. That is a standard, the cross, the pole. It's just two pieces of lumber that Jesus was on, right? It's trash. And he equaled himself to that saying, I will, just as, just as the son of man, uh, just as Moses must lift up the serpent in the desert, so much the son of man also be lifted up, right? So he equated himself in that uh, form that he was in, filled with sin without being sinful, to be equal to trash on uh on that site of where the skull is to give people a representation. They're going to put this trashy little mark on their head for Lent and then it's going to follow up. They're going to, they're going to put this mark on, the, on their body to condemn themselves. So I need you to understand that he's given us uh, the Hebrew word. I had, to, I had to do some digging because when he first showed to me that uh, cross was in the literal translations of these versions, I didn't, I didn't really question where was the word, where was it coming from? Because I knew in my spirit from understanding of the Holy Ghost, he was saying the cross mark on a test means wrong. So as soon as I saw the, the cross mark, I understood, well, the scripture is saying don't get a tattoo at all because it's wrong. So therefore people put the, the X mark there. This wasn't the reason. See, that was my assumption based on what the Holy Ghost was leading me into. He told me to look further. So when I looked further, I investigated the word of where it comes from, and it comes from a word in Hebrew that was translated to the Greek, and it means stigmata. And stigmata, if you've ever seen a movie that is a scary movie involved with the Catholic Church and all this stuff where they're trying to extricate demons or um, exercise demons, then you start to see that they have uh, this mythology going on, this legend. Uh, filled with lies of, of people gaining supernatural marks like Jesus did. Jesus doesn't want anybody marked up in the supernatural like he was. He took our place. You got to understand, he took our place so that we wouldn't suffer those things at the cross. If he wanted us to suffer the events of the cross, he would not have gone to the cross. Come on, Holy Ghost, thank you, Jesus. He would have not gone to the cross and traded places with us. He would have just let us go to the cross and die. He died on our behalf so we wouldn't have to suffer that. He doesn't want us to suffer that. So with the Catholic Church promoting these things, these ideas of all the suffering, stigmata, meaning all the suffering that pertains to the cross of Christ or the cross itself. That's what stigmata means. So with all that suffering that was then placed on, do not get a tattoo or mark your body at all. It is wrong. In fact, don't get anything stigmata in the Greek from the Hebrew, right? So it's saying don't get stigmata at all. Don't get a mark of a cross at all. So that's why you see that cross mark is there in the literal translations and not in the King James. But even from the King James, it's the same one that they use, which is stigmata, okay? So I just want you guys to know that and understand he was preparing for us in advance the, the knowledge, uh, preparing the mind in advance don't receive this mark. Don't get comfortable with these marks on your body because you're going to be misled. But if you follow my word, my commands, he says, if you obey my commands, then you truly are my people. If you follow my commands, he's not saying that you can fulfill the commands. He's saying follow. When you follow along, you're, you're paying attention. You're paying close attention to what's going on there. And you start to absorb and understand what God does not like. And even though we're not trying to keep the law, we are aware of what the law forbids, and therefore we won't step into those things because we're aware of it now. Like, ooh, no, he, he don't like tattoos. We know for sure because we're saved. And listen to me, I'm saying this because I don't want you to feel condemned. The scripture says, for when we believe and receive the Holy Spirit, we can never be condemned. Even if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. So we have nothing to worry about on that end. So when we see things happening, when people are producing fruits of rottenness by homosexuality and murder and other sins, or a stealing and whatnot or lying, we see that they're not bearing the fruits of repentance. We see that their spirit, the Holy Ghost, mm, they may not actually have the spirit of the Holy Ghost, right? They're just claiming to be Christians and they're not actually keeping up 
with the Holy Ghost because they've never received him. They've been deceived all this time, lying, right? Lying to themselves, playing church. So uh, God wanted for us to stay away from the cross mark so that we wouldn't get comfortable and get deceived, right? So he then tells us in uh, John chapter uh, 16, verse 20, John chapter 16, verse 20, he says, in the context of the grief to joy, check this out, he says, uh, aware that they wanted to question him. Jesus said to them, are you asking one another why I said in a little while, you will not see me. He's talking about going to his death. You won't see me for a time. He's talking about going to the cross. After this, you won't see me for a while. And then after a little while, you will see me. Truly, truly, I tell you, you will weep and wail while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman has pain in childbirth because her time has come, but when she brings forth her child, she forgets her anguish because her joy, because of her joy that a child has been born into the world. Now, he spoke about that, the child being born into the world, the woman going through birth pains and all these things. He spoke about this in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, I don't remember which ones, but that's for you to do your Google due diligence and, and look through your Bible and f uh, find out and be more informed when and what passages he's talked about these things. But remember, he talked about these things, uh, informing them that there would be a great tribulation that would happen and it would be like the birth pains. He said, uh, hope that your your uh, your flight is not in the winter, right? So he was talking about uh, the time that the Antichrist will be revealed. Um, all these tragic things around the world will be happening, these worldwide events. Uh, that are supernatural, natural events going on in the atmosphere and in the weather and in the earth, cracking with earthquakes and in the wars and the rumors of wars and all these different things. And the church has been raptured. The apostasy has happened. The government is now enforcing a mark that is that is attached. And people forget this and they go, oh, it's COVID. The mark of the beast is COVID. The mark of the beast has to be a image of an idol. The mark has to be the very image of an idol, meaning a statue that some people pray to religiously because the mark has to be attached to a religion and then enforced by a government and backed by money, right? So that they get you to worship two things, the idol itself in the form of the mark and then the money itself, which is also an idol when you worship it, it's mammon, right? So they're confirming that this person is is sold out to these gods okay so all that has to happen and be connected to a mark in order for it to actually be the certified symbol mark of the beast so i want to i want to take you into uh further with the grief to joy where he's saying i need you to catch this he says truly truly i tell you you will weep during this event and wail while the world does what they rejoice this is the time he's talking about. He's he's informing Peter and the rest of the group, his disciples, his followers and believers, that he's going to go to a place and it's going to take them into suffering apostasy, meaning they won't be filled in the joy anymore. They'll be uh, down in the dumps, depressed, empty, void of all that happiness. They'll be going a completely different direction as if they have left the church, right? Left the organization, the building, the body, left the rest of the body alone. They're no longer together. They're dispersed. The whole hundreds that he had together, they're all just a few now separated, right? They're not in togetherness. They don't have hope. They're in a state of despair. They're depressed. Their spirit is downcast, down in the dumps. It's all darkness, gloom, and doom. And the Catholic Church has painted a perfect picture that there is light beaming on the cross at this time. Jesus has dropped the cross three times. These are things that have never happened. And the scripture gives us clear understanding that during this time, uh, he fell, Jesus, face first on the ground as a witness we have two witnesses from the Bible. This is how it went. I give you every detail. The King James never leaves out the things that we need to know. He says he fell face first on the ground, Jesus. And then he spoke to God. He begged God, asked God, pleaded with God, if you can take away this cup, remember? So we know that he fell face down the ground, giving us every detail. Then the people who came to him, he said, I am giving them a hint to he is God of the Old Testament, the invisible now made visible. I am, let my people go. Just like, Mo, just like Moses said, he said in his own way, check this out, let my disciples go. And he said, I am before this, when he said, I am, the people fell down, the enemies of God fell down and they fell down backwards, 
Remember that. They fell down backwards. He, he fell down face first on purpose. They fell down backwards. This is all during the time that he's entering into this cross mode, going into this cross thing, right? And he has already envisioned all this stuff, seen all this prophetically, and has been tormented by all this prophetically. And he overcame it, stepped through his fear, walked into this disaster anyway, and took that upon himself for us. So we don't ever have to take that on ourselves. We don't ever have to bear the cross physically on ourselves. He physically bear the cross. Come on. He physically bear the cross for us because he was determined, a resolute protector to save us from that thing. So he told Peter, Peter, you cannot go where I'm about to go now, he said, because later he would then go and carry his own cross uh, figuratively. In the supernatural, he would be suffering all these different pains um, and torments and anguish that he's going through. He has to bear that himself. That is his own cross he has to bear. It is never a physical thing. So if Peter would have went to the cross, it would have defeated the purpose of what Jesus was trying to do. And he would have got no salvation from it. Peter down on the cross would have granted us no salvation at all either, even after the fact. So when the popes and the, the Catholic magistrate and the other uh, committed, devoted followers of the brainwashing committee try to convince you that Peter and Paul went to the cross, you got to tell them, no, Jesus told the Jews and the Jews who betrayed him, who knew the law, and the Romans who came with their, their swords and their spears and their shields and, and their binding equipment to uh, lock that man up and to maintain him, they, um, they were told by Jesus the enemies of God, they were told by Jesus, let my people go. Let my disciples go because they have nothing to do with this. They don't have anything to do with this cross stuff. So Jesus confirmed, Peter, you can't go to the cross physically. You got to suffer your cross in the, in the spiritual realm. You have to suffer that mentally, right? You have to go through that figuratively to represent to the, to the rest of the people how you're supposed to go about doing this. You can't go to the cross now. You can't, you can't come and suffer now like the way I'm suffering. You can't do that. It's forbidden. He, it was so forbidden that he even said, no, I don't know that man three times. Mm -mm, no, no, no. It ain't my time to die. No, he's already given me a command. I can't. No. Mm -mm. If he would have confessed it, he would have died that day more than likely, right? On that cross with him. He, no, it's not permitted. And God, God just wiped it away like it never even happened because he had already told him, you can't go. You can't go to the cross. Jesus said that. You can't go to the cross, Peter. You can't come here and, and do what I'm about to do. OK, it's not your time for that. When you do it, it's going to be a figurative sense of suffering. And then he says to them, the enemies of God, let my disciples go. They're not allowed to go to the cross and do this physical thing like I'm going to do this physical thing. You see, whenever God does a supernatural miracle in a person's life, he always does it uniquely for the individual. But it's the same miracle. So he gave us that example. And he shows us, since they can't go to the cross, I've given you this, this evidence, they have to suffer this in a different way. So the Apostle Paul, in all his context, every time you read it, it will always state that it's something that we have to do in suffering nature, not in the physical, right? So it always lines up with the context. So the Bible always witnesses to the Bible. And he clears it up that he didn't fall down three times with the cross. Nowhere in scripture does it ever say that. Nowhere. But the Catholic magistrate has brainwashed people into believing this is a part of the story that God forgot in the Bible. God forgot nothing. He was able to pass down all these books, which were scrolls first from men's hands all the way down, just like he keeps the planets together. He keeps all this aligned without the help of men. If he can keep plants together in orbit without them smashing into each other, without us being kicked out just a few kilometers deeper into space and freeze to death or deeper into space towards the sun and then we fry up, right? We could set on fire and burn to death. He can keep all that from happening to keep comets and stars and asteroids from falling onto the planet until just one does, which is mentioned in Revelations, right? Only one is mentioned to come. But then you have these people in history who are saying, who are saying dinosaurs were destroyed by comets that hit the earth. God is able to keep all that from happening. It's all lies. It's all blasphemy. He's able to keep all that together. And you're telling me he can't keep the pages of some scrolls together to form a book appropriately with the appropriate writing, with the appropriate language, not one ot or tittle missing, 
right? That's given in the scripture. Don't change any of that. You telling me God give you a command not to change none of that, but then he can't keep the book together. He can't keep the writings together. He can't keep the letters together of his own language or even of another language. He can't possess men's hands or their mouths and have them proclaim a, a, a word and a message through him that he keeps together. He can. He's not all powerful. That's what the Catholic Church is explaining to you and telling you if you believe he, he fell down three times with the cross and did not include that in the King James 66 book version of the narrative. You're saying God's not all powerful. He's not sovereign. He's not in control. He didn't lose nothing. He didn't miss nothing. Okay. He gave us a book that was founded by a king that he put in position of power that we can trust. Amen. Glory to God. So he then gives us the illustration. Uh, ooh, the popes and the fathers of their churches. It ain't my father, but that's their fathers, right? These Catholic believers. They, they believe that there was a light shining down on the cross. So let's debunk that. It says... Let me show you the, the, the atmosphere, because a lot of the times people miss this. A lot of the times in your spirit, whatever you're going through in the supernatural, when you're going through a storm or a test, your person, your mind, spirit, rocks, right? A breath, one entity, persona, thought, idea, character can be all in gloom and doom and darkness, just like the apostles were here. The followers, the many followers, the multitude, I'm about to show you this here in the three different gospels of, of uh, Mark, Luke, and John. And when you're depressed in your spirit here sometimes you need to just check outside and see what's going on outside because sometimes the atmosphere outside can also be suffering some type of de depression the same way when you see on the news hurricanes are forming and, and um uh, tropical storms are forming because they're it's going through a tropical depression that's air that's oxygen that's wind breath of god entity persona of god hurricane means god of the storm Right. So there's a persona outside and it can be depressed as well. And when you see that, that can sometimes give you an, an inkling, a understanding that what you're going through is something that's just passing on. You, will, you don't have to stay in it. You can get out of your storm and out of your test faster if you seek shelter. In the, the proper end result of what you're supposed to learn in your storm, how to survive, how to thrive during your storm, during your terrible situation or how to ace your test more quickly. You don't have to stay in that. So when you see that outside, you can change your mode and say, hey, I'm not about to enter into that even though there's a storm coming. I'm not about to enter into that because my mind is already fixed. I can seek shelter and I can get out of it. Or you can you can seek a place of stability whenever it's trying to, to blow you away. It's trying to make you switch your mind up and, and, and curse God and, and get you angry at God. It's just a storm passing. You don't have to stay in it. You can find positivity and get back into God and stay secured in God. Don't be double-minded and be like a flag that's wavering that serpent on the pole, right? Who come on, Jesus. So he shows us the atmosphere, what's going on, because I need you to understand what the people were going through mentally was also going on on the outside in the scriptures. Let's prove this. It says in Mark chapter 16, verse 10, she went and told those who had been with him, who were mourning and weeping. So it says those, these are a, a group of people, many of people, but then it says in Luke, which is the one bearing light, he's shedding light on the subject. Luke chapter 23, verse 27, a great number. So it went from those to a great number of people followed him, including women who kept mourning and wailing for him. So the men, the women and the children, those, the great multitude, the great number of people, they were all mourning and weeping. Right. Nobody was satisfied. Nobody was happy. Nobody was there praising God. People had been went apostate, which means cross. They had went apostate a different direction. They had go, gone completely the opposite against their normal activity with Jesus. It was all sunshines and rainbows and unicorn for us. When Jesus was here, they were happy and hyped up and they had the light of the world in them. Now that he is gone, right? He suffered at the cross. He's in the grave. He's in the tomb. He's in the dirt. He's down there preaching to the captives in the prisons of not hell, but uh, across from that, not hell, but across from that, he's down there in a safe place called Abraham's bosom. And he's teaching all the people who were dead from long ago in the Old Testament up until this point. And then he's getting ready to resurrect right their spirits and bring them to heaven right so he has to be down there three days he says in the belly of the beast by which the roman empire with their mark symbol of the beast sent him down there right so it then says 
John chapter 20, see this vision, right? 2020, the vision, understand. He says, after he had said this, I need you to, to understand something with your mind. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord because he was now resurrected. You understand? Now they had something to be happy about again. So we need to go back to the context of grief to joy in chapter John 16 and 20. It says, truly, truly, I tell you, you will weep and wail while the world rejoices. Say again. He says, you will weep and wail. We saw that. We saw that from three of the witnesses of the gospel. There was weeping and wailing because he was dead, because he did what? He suffered the stigmata, the thing we were warned to stay away from. We were warned to, to not tattoo on ourselves, the cross, stigmata, the cross. We were warned to stay away from that. It says that the people who were in the world, who belonged to the world, who were worldly, was rejoicing. Remember, they chose Barabbas, which means son of the father. And Jesus was right next to him, who is the actual son of the father. They chose the wrong uh, 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 son of the father, which was a representation of you have the, the Christ and then you have the Antichrist. Christ is known for resurrections, uh, reviving himself from the dead. And then you have the one who is known for insurrections, uh, Barabbas, which means son of the father. So you have the wrong son of the father who would dare cause insurrections. He was known for this because he was a criminal who was also uh, uh, infamous, uh, very well known in, in a terrible way for inciting the people to overthrow the government. Remember, Jesus says he sets up the government right in the, in the invisible form of the father who sits in the the infinite place of power and authority right the right hand of god a position a status right and he sets up kings he sets up authorities the the, the government rests on his shoulders the same way he set up the 12 uh, of the governing body of christ of the church right those were the governing bodies the disciples so when he set that up he set that up for a purpose we are not supposed to disrespect the same way with uh those who rule in courts, judges, and, and things like that, right? Bailiffs and whatnot. Uh, so he says the world is the one who's rejoicing. The people who don't belong to him. He didn't say his disciples were rejoicing. He said, my disciples, my believers, they're, they're angry at this cross business. They're upset about this cross business. They're crying and weeping about this cross business. Nobody's happy to put up a cross in their home or hang one on their bathroom wall over their toilet. Or, or to have earrings dangling from their ears who belong to Jesus. None of them were happy about the cross. And then check this out. Because they were so in gloom and doom, I gave you that from Mark, Luke, and John. Chapter 16, 10, 23, 27, 20, 20. They're all mourning, weeping, disturbed, apostate, down in the dumps, depressed about this cross business. Nobody's welcoming the cross who belong to Jesus. They're all depressed. It's all darkness in them. It's all darkness in their mind and their behavior is dark because they don't have the hope, the light of the world anymore in their presence, right? They have to have something to reflect. Remember, Adam is the man who, who tends to the earth. That is his ministry and he reflects God's glory, his goodness. It is the woman who then reflects that of the man. The women were acting the same way and the children were acting the same way because the men were acting out in a way that was completely contrary apostate to Jesus nature it was all gloom and doom now no hope right so let's see it says uh Luke for the atmosphere we talked about the people in their mental atmosphere now we need to talk about the, the literal atmosphere was there a light pierced on the cross no let's prove that right now it says in Luke this is the one that bears light right we're, we're shedding light on the subject what does it say in Luke in the um the international version Chapter 23, verse 44 through 46, it says, uh, it was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon for the sun stopped shining. There was no sunlight in that area, right? There was no sunlight going on in Golgotha, the place of the skull, the giant with the mark on its head, right? It then says in the, in the message Bible, I like this one. It says it was a total blackout. There was no light, total blackout, complete darkness. So not only were the people mentally in darkness, suffering a storm mentally, going through something, 
mentally. Nobody else is aware of it, but you're going through something mentally and nobody else can see it. But those in Christ who have, who have also gone through this kind of, we got an understanding of, of something you're kind of suffering because we done suffer something like that too. So the whole land, not just the people in their mind, but even the physical, the atmosphere, the inner and the outer atmospheres were in darkness. But there was some people rejoicing like there was light shining somewhere. And that was the ones who loved the cross, Jesus is saying. Because remember, that scripture is, is said by Jesus. Jesus said this with his own mouth. You, my disciples, you hundreds of believers who believe in me, you'll be sad about this cross business. But the rest of the world will be happy to put a cross up in their home. They'll be happy to wear a cross on their T-shirt. They'll be happy to have crosses hanging in their in their vehicle. The worldly ones, Jesus said. We're going to talk about that in a second. Just a little, just a little bit more. So the uh, the in uh, the, the NASB, the New American Standard Bible, puts it this way. It says, because the sun was obscured. The NLT, the New Living Translation, puts it this way. It says, the light from the sun was gone. The King James says, and the sun was darkened. The New Century Version Bible says, because the sun did not shine. I like this one even better. Even better because the ASV, the American Standard Version, besides a blackout, it says, the sun's light was failing like an X mark, people like a cross, failing. The sun's light was crossed, it was failing. The sun's light was apostate. It, it then went anti, into darkness. Who? come on, come on. So let's go back to it, let's go back to it. Let's go back to it and we're gonna teach you why the people were rejoicing. Who? We're talking about the people of the cross, the sons of disobedience. Let me show you how much they are the sons of disobedience according to God's word and history. Let me show you. Come on. Let me show you. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you. We put in the Aramaic Bible, the Aramaic version of the Bible. It says, uh, Timeless truth I speak to you. You shall weep and mourn, and the world will rejoice, and you will have sorrow, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. They were joyous when he was resurrected. He's back in the world. They were sorry. What was the cross business going on? While the cross was coming out, they were sorry. And then whenever the Jews were being dispersed, they were running for their lives. They were running for their lives because of the cross. That's even in the Bible, right? They were running for their lives. They couldn't stay in Jerusalem anymore because the Romans were threatening them with the very symbol that killed their master, our master, Jesus Christ. You understand? He says a timeless truth, not just for this second, not just for this moment, not just for this minute, not just for this hour, not just for this day, not just for this week, not just for this month, not just for this year, but years to come, he's saying. And not just years to come, centuries to come. And not just centuries to come, he's saying. He's saying thousands of years to come and not just that. This is timeless. Even in the present time still stands, this is timeless. He said, a timeless truth. I'm trying to tell you about the people who love the cross. I need you to focus. I need you to understand and get where I'm coming from. He's saying, this is a timeless truth. Who's speaking? Jesus. And people act like Jesus would love this cross business. And they witnessed this to my face. And I told them, be careful. You're falsely witnessing against the Holy Ghost. He hates idols. He hates marks. He hates crosses. Be careful tread lightly look jesus is saying in the god word translation a timeless truth i can guarantee this truth he says in the god word translation i can guarantee this truth you my disciples will be sad about this cross business anything to do with this cross you're going to be sad about it you're not going to enjoy it you're going to be depressed down in the dumps sad about it you won't be glorifying it in the way that these people are glorifying it you understand you're not going to have an appreciation for the cross you can have an appreciation for me, but be sad about what happened to me. But the worldly ones, the ones who belong in the world, he said a timeless truth. They are the ones who belong in the world. Timeless truth. Just like it was back then, he said then, they belong to the world who love the cross. That's still the same way now because it's timeless. It ain't changed. Nothing's changed about the situation. The atmosphere for them is still the same. The cross is gloom and doom, and they're happy about it. They love it. They want to promote it. They want to proclaim it and confuse people and get them to believe as confusingly as they've been deceived. This is the way you follow Jesus Christ. No, they belong to the world, Jesus said. He said, I can guarantee this truth. They belong to the world. 
He's saying they don't belong to me. They belong to the world. I'm about to prove to you with this other cross how people belong to the world. Check this out. Check this out. Stay with me now. Come on. Stay with me. He says, he says in Egypt, he would destroy the statues, right? So when we go into Egypt, there was a cross there that is called the Ankh and Sata. And what's so fantastic about this Ankh, everyone uses it. The Asians believe in it. The Hindu believe in it. There's uh, uh, the blacks and whites who believe in it. And blacks who truly trust and believe in this thing so hard. It is, it's where they come from. It's the key to life to enter into the next stage after this world. They believe it's the key. So let me show you who has been handling you all this time. When you say unk, you're saying a cross. And cross also means a crux, which is a curse, which are proved in videos past. You can do that by uh, synonyms, dictionaries, etymologies. They're all the same thing, right? So you have the unk, which in uh, from its language, it actually means to be um, a, a meaning for life and then also for soul. So unk is for cross, life, and soul. But then you have ansata, which means handled. And I need you to see how Satan has handled a person's life or soul with this cross. Ansata spells a Satan perfectly without adding anything from it, without taking anything from it. So I gave you three before, right? I gave you two before, I'm giving you three now. So check this out. You got a uh, Christian who has a cross over his chest as a, uh, a, a, um, a chain charm or, uh, or, or a good luck uh, symbol or a rosary, right? So that's uh, the Christian with the lowercase t spells antichrist perfectly. But then you also have cross, which means anti-opposition or opposed. That's um, anti. So then you have cross of Christ, which is antichrist. That's two ways that it spells antichrist to give people a solid warning. Stay away from this item. Stay away from this stigmata, right? Stay away from this thing you're not supposed to tattoo or put on your body at all. Right? That's from the Old Testament to the New Testament. God was trying to keep you from it, giving you clear warnings. Then you have this third one that's Unk Ansata, which is the curse of Satan, right? By which means uh, Satan has handled the person's life or soul by putting a curse on it. That's Unk Ansata. On their life or soul, it has been handled by Satan. That's how he has tricked the world and he's going to handle them yet again the same way the Catholic Church has been handling people to put this curse mark jutsu on their hand and on their forehead and having them believe some stuff that's not even true. It's not even the Bible. He never fell down three times but yet he gave us clear indication. Look, there's two falling in here though. One where I fall on my face and one where the enemies fall before me. And I say exactly how it's done. Why would I leave that out? I'm giving you everything because I'm a good father. I gave you a Bible, an instruction manual of how you're supposed to live your life due to basic instructions, which sometimes go even beyond that. It goes beyond basic and it goes completely intricate of how you're supposed to receive and believe in God, right? Your basic instructions before leaving her, I gave you this manual. A how-to guide. How do you operate in spirit? How do you function doing this? How are you supposed to get to that? How are you supposed to believe? I've given you all this to help you stay away from these things, to protect you. So he's given us a clear sign. Three ways the cross of Christ does not even belong to Christ. But there is a scripture that says, if they hate the cross of Christ. And I need to, to have you understand, because if you haven't seen my other video, you wouldn't know. And you'd be scared. You go, well, we can't hate the cross. Look at what the Apostle Paul is saying. The Apostle Paul is saying in that context, there are people who would deny that the events of the crucifixion have even happened. That's the people who hate the cross of Christ. He's not saying the cross. He's saying the affliction. They hate the suffering and the affliction of Christ so much that they would deny it even happened. Those people hate the cross of Christ. That's the understanding. Read the context without the text that the, the, that the, 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 uh, the content came from, the wholeness of the text, you're being left out. You get conned because you took it out of the text and read it just for what it was, just for what it says, without knowing what the top and the bottom, the rest of the context says. You've cheated yourself. You need the whole content. The tent is where you're supposed to be in the temple worshiping God, 
reading his word, getting closer to him, inviting the Holy Spirit in to give you understanding about what's going on so you can get clarity. Because he's not the author of confusion, but he did make the book in a confusing matter because he's God. And our minds can't comprehend God-level stuff on the natural. So when you read it, you'll read something, you'll get confused. Go, oh, it says, well, his head was white, but his hair was also white, so he must have been a white man. And then some others go, well, we read that his feet is bronze, he must have been a black man. But you didn't read the rest of the context. The angel goes in there and he says, I'll explain all these different things for you because you don't, you, don't, you don't get it. You don't have to take that literal no more. I need to explain this because that's, that's figurative. That represents his glory. So people get lost in that. It's not intended for you to read it by yourself. You'll get lost. You'll get lost. The same way, the same way uh, one of the disciples had to, I think it was Philip, he had to go to a man who was a, uh, a eunuch and he said, he was already there reading in the chair and he said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how am I supposed to understand what I'm reading? God witnessed through that man who didn't even have God in him yet. He witnessed and said, how am I supposed to read this and understand this? This is a mystery to me. This is so confusing. It's confusing to me. I don't get it. Philip, Jesus had to send somebody in the spirit who had the spirit, teleported that man, raptured that man, and then moved him to the, I like how you tied that in, raptured that man, and then moved him to the next playing field to show him, look, we sow in seeds like this. This is the man, Jesus Christ. This book is about him. This is how you go about learning about him and worshiping him. This is all the stuff that was written of him in the book, right? So he had to give him somebody, a pastor of his own choosing, didn't care if he liked it, didn't care if it wasn't something that he wanted. God sends who he decides to send and uses them the way he wants to use them because he's sovereign and he's the one who calls the shots no matter what somebody else wants. But the finality of this is it says Jesus gives us his guarantee, not Paul, not somebody else. Jesus himself, because people act like, oh, well, I can do whatever I want and I'm good. As long as it's good between me and Jesus, I can wear this cross if I want to. Jesus said, no, I give you the scripture, a solemn truth, timeless truth, in fact, and a rock solid, because he is the rock of our salvation, a rock solid guarantee. The ones who love wearing the cross don't belong to to me. They belong to the one who owns the Ankh Ansata, a curse of Satan who handles their life and their soul. Who? That's good preaching. I've been Dr. Paul the Lesser. This has been proven all things. Done. Why must you call down another blow? I'm sent, I'm sent.